September 9th, 1999. He was a loner with unique access to the Soviets' top secrets and a secret of his own. He wrote down on pieces of paper, brought him out of KGB headquarters in his sock. Over the course of 12 years, he squirreled away information that the United States could only dream about. He diligently and studiously copied KGB files. What a swell kick in the ass. When the Soviet Union fell apart, he made his move to the West. It was like having a puzzle and getting, uh, getting all the uh, border pieces. And handed over the KGB's playbook of dirty tricks. It was swell. <laughs> it was just great. Tonight, the KGB finds how one man pulled off the unthinkable. From ABC News. This is Nightline. Reporting from Washington, Ted Koppel. The trouble with a great intelligence coup is that you can never know for sure whether it's real. I mean, imagine yourself for a moment in the role of a CIA officer based at a U.S. embassy, and someone walks in off the street offering a virtual roadmap to Soviet intelligence operations covering a 50-year period. Only the offer is made at a time when the Soviet Union itself is collapsing. It is not at all that unusual for would-be defectors to present themselves at American embassies, all of them, of course, wanting to be resettled in a pleasant house with a comfortable pension and new identities for themselves and their families. Resettlement to be somewhere in the United States, somewhere warm. Such a process is hugely expensive, and the U.S. government does not make such commitments lightly. And anyway, in this particular case, and we are talking about an actual incident, the promised intelligence bonanza was just too grandiose. It would be the sort of haul that could set CIA and FBI wheels spinning for years to come. Just checking out all the claims would absorb a huge amount of manpower. In some respects, it had all the earmarks of a golden apple with a poisonous core. So you can't really blame the CIA officer who let Vasily Mitrokin get away. ABC's national security correspondent, John McQuethy, has the story. Vasily Mitrokin walked into the U.S. Embassy in Riga, Latvia in 1992 and tried to defect. He was turned away. CIA officials who handled defectors, overwhelmed at the time by hundreds of Russians trying to get to the West, said they were not interested. Matrokin was not a spy, after all, just essentially a librarian. Paul Redman, then head of CIA counterintelligence, argued to bring Matrokin in. No one listened. There was no interest in him in the, in the division that was supposed to be running operations against the former Soviets. It was a very, in my view, breathtakingly stupid thing. So Matrokin went to the British embassy in Latvia, where after long discussion, he was allowed to defect. This is probably one of the most, if not the most important defector that I've seen in the 20th century. Matrokin had been in charge of the KGB's top secret archives. Angry with his government's constant lies to its people, he began secretly taking notes on what he was reading, smuggling those notes out of KGB headquarters in his socks or trousers. For more than a decade, he buried the accumulating paper in trunks under his house. When he defected, the British helped Matrokin smuggle six trunks of his notes out of Russia. He is absolutely unique. John Martin, former Justice Department espionage prosecutor, said until now, Matrokin and his secret files have been one of the West's most closely guarded secrets. It was swell. <laughs> it was just great. This very simple Russian, this bureaucrat, was so disgusted with the evil and immoral regime under which he operated. He was not recruited by Western intelligence. He was not paid. For over a decade, he diligently and studiously copied KGB files. What a swell kick in the ass. And a lot of the information was like 
reading the other side's uh, mail to simply, you know, learn what the enemy has been doing all these years in such detail and such volume and such accuracy is very amazing. He now lives in a safe house in Britain. Officials assume he still has a price on his head, but Matrokin insisted that some of his work be made public, and it will in a book to be published next week. For the FBI, Matrokin provided a chance to re-energize espionage cases that had been dormant for decades. There were hundreds of cases or leads opened. Robert Bear Bryant, deputy director of the FBI, said Matrokin's files helped fill in the blanks of many old espionage puzzles. Basically, in a lot of areas, it gave you the border pieces to the puzzle, and uh, some of it gave you the, the heart of it, too. You have no doubt that this, is, this guy was the real thing? None. Matrokin's information helped to convict Robert Lipka of espionage in 1996. He had spied for the Soviets in the late 1960s when he worked as a clerk at the National Security Agency. The FBI had followed his trail but could never identify him until they had Matrokin's information. He is now serving an 18-year sentence and there could soon be others. It's m massive detail. The material contains incredible detail on some major spy cases. Sources say about a dozen other cases are actively being pursued. ABC News has learned one of those cases is against Felix Block, the highest ranking State Department official ever investigated for espionage. In 1989, Block was fired, had his pension taken away, but the FBI lacked evidence to charge him. Anybody who was a Soviet agent from 85 or earlier can never sleep comfortable again. But the greatest benefit of Matrokin's files may not be in putting spies behind bars, but in the sweeping detail they provide of what the Soviets were up to during the last decades of the Cold War. He is really making a massive contribution to our understanding of Soviet activities going back a very long time. Not only about espionage and intelligence collection, but also covert action. Some of what the Soviets did, some of what they planned, was outrageous. They tried unsuccessfully to recruit as a spy Zbigniew Brzezinski, vehement critic of the Soviets who became President Carter's national security advisor, and Cyrus Vance who became Secretary of State. They also pitched to German leader Willy Brandt. They tried to influence points of tension in American society. The KGB planted stories that civil rights leader Martin Luther King was secretly working with President Johnson and had sold out to the white establishment. Ironically, the FBI at the same time was also trying to discredit King by claiming that he had ties to the communists. Though the FBI knew that the Soviets were intercepting U.S. communications, Matrokin's files provided vivid details of some of what the KGB actually got. There are records of phone conversations between Henry Kissinger, the national security advisor to President Nixon, and his fiancée, as well as calls to other diplomats. Fax and phone lines of major defense contractors were tapped, with details of new planes and tanks routinely falling into Soviet hands. There were spies in major companies like General Electric and IBM. The port of New York was a target for potential sabotage with KGB files showing details of work schedules and weak points of security. Much of what these documents show, the FBI and CIA had long suspected but could not prove. Now they know. John McQuethy for Nightline in Washington. Once upon a time, Paul Redmond and Oleg Kalugin were on opposite sides of the Cold War divide their take on the KGB files when we come back. This is ABC News Nightline, brought to you by Mitsubishi. If you had to be stranded on a deserted island with just one other person, who would it be? A boat builder? Or a survival expert? Perhaps a fisherman? Or... Would it just be someone who looks really good in a swimsuit? Introducing the all-new 2000 Mitsubishi Eclipse, nicely equipped at 17.7.
There are more sensible choices, but who cares? Okay, we know there are enough calling plans on this planet. Yeah, it's way too complicated. Make it simple. I will. You see, with new AT&T one rate, seven cent plan, it's nothing but simple. It's seven cents a minute all day, every day, whenever you call. There are no 10, 10 numbers to dial. Or those nickel rates that are sometimes a quarter. No, that, that was not me. With AT&T one rate, it's, it's simple, period. So what was confusing is now not. I like simple. Simple is good. And tomatoes. Even better. All day, every day. Call 1-800-41-RATE to enroll. I know who killed Champagne. She was the first detective inside the Ramsey house, the only officer there when the body was found. Now she speaks out on Good Morning America Monday. If you're an American Indian or of American Indian descent and you're unemployed, underemployed, or economically disadvantaged, there's hope on the horizon. The American Indian Center's Employment and Training Program for Tennessee can help you stretch your horizons to learn new skills and get a job. This program, sponsored by the American Indian Center, offers classroom training, on-the-job training, work experience, and community service employment. If you're an American Indian, here's an opportunity to stretch your horizons. Call the American Indian Center. It can change your life. This is the one. Profits one day sale. This Saturday only. Save 25 to 75 percent. For her, for him, and for the home. Profits one day sale. Starts early, 9 a.m. Just one day, Saturday. Just one place. Profits. And joining us now from Berlin, Germany, Oleg Kalugin, the youngest general in the history of the KGB who became head of foreign intelligence. Then a critic of the Soviet Union, he moved to the United States. And in Washington, Paul Redmond, who was Deputy Director of Counterintelligence of the CIA when Vasily Mitrokin defected and later became Chief of the Division. General Kalugin, uh, did you ever know Mitrokin? Did you know of him? No, I do not recall the name, though I'm aware of his defection. I learned it not too long ago, and I was stunned by what he had brought with him to the West. Why? Because it's a remarkable case, uh, unlike other books and uh, recollections uh, based on uh, personal experiences, this is a collection of documents, uh, something which is uh, uh, people wanted for so long, no rumors, no gossip, realities of life, people would not believe what the KGB, the old KGB had been trying to do to the West, now they know and because they are documents, not just simply memoirs or recollections, they'll be, uh, I'm sure, have a devastating effect on the history of the KGB and its uh, estimate in the eyes of not only in the West, but among the Russians themselves, who unfortunately still believe that this organization protected them from the West and tried it its best. They will show the organization at its real just. Tell me for a moment what you think it is in those documents that is so outrageous, because I must confess to you that much of what I've heard, much of what I've seen, that uh, at least is in the, in the book to be published, uh, I had heard about 25 years ago. I mean, the, the notion that the KGB was trying to recruit uh, even Henry Kissinger at that time, trying to recruit uh, Zbigniew Brzezinski, those were rumors even in the mid-70s. That's, that's not new. Well, it's not really uh, the recruitment uh, targets, it's probably active measures, a whole range of uh, plans which uh, meant or uh, were targeted the uh, vital institutions of the West, uh, uh, dams, uh, water supplies, electric grids, uh, uh, arms caches, uh, and also uh, explosions. Uh, uh, for instance, uh, I understand that Mitrokin in his book reveals one of the plans of the KGB to blow an explosive somewhere in the midst of the Afro-American community to increase tensions and, uh, well, uh, then accuse the whites of racism. It's now obvious that all these accusations thrown at the KGB over the period of time have now found confirmation in real archive documents. And this is very important. They are not rumors, they are not gossip, not uh, feeble uh, recollections of the past. 
They are based on classified top secrets of the KGB. Mr. Redmond, let me come at you from a totally different direction. What if the KGB were operating with, with a massive disinformation campaign here? What if it unloaded a whole pile of some of it real, some of it accurate, much of it not, uh, with, the, with the simple intent of tying up the FBI and the CIA for years with lots of ex experts and analysts going through this material. Perhaps there would be material in here to discredit people who actually are not agents or to speak of agents who have long left the country. Uh, that's certainly a possibility, isn't it? Well, I, I think it's really impossible given the detail, the massive amount of information. And secondly, a lot of it adds to information already known, as you alluded to, and it fills in the blanks and some other situations that Bear Bryant alluded to. And I cannot conceive of anybody have, what the purpose would be of giving this vast amount of data to misinform and confuse us. As far as keeping us busy, it, I don't think it's kept the U.S. intelligence or counterintelligence people that busy all these years. Well, I think it's inconceivable. Give me, give me a sense of, uh, if you can give me some specifics, I'd love to hear them, but what is it that just blew you away when you learned it? What blew me away, one, was the detail, and two, the uh, degree of which the KGB operated aggressively and in some cases absolutely ruthlessly in this country. They apparently had, as my recollection from the material, which I read in the original translation, an audio device for four years in the United States Senate Foreign Relations Committee meeting room. They ran an audio operation against a company in Arlington, Virginia, uh, one of those Beltway Bandit outfits where Pentagon people would make presentations. They got tremendous information on our weapon systems in Europe, things like that, our own chemical weapons things and, like, and situations like that. So it was amazing to me to see in notes from documents the, how aggressive and effective they've been. They also were extraordinarily effective in taking advantage of, of the colossal lack of security on the part of the defense contractors of this country who were faxing things in the open about our weapon systems. They were getting it and exploiting it. And at one point, as I recall from those documents, roughly 50 percent, according to one of uh, Mitrokin's notes, roughly 50% of the defense development projects in the Soviet Union were based on secrets stolen in the West. That surely doesn't surprise you, though, does it? I mean, didn't you it, assume it, all along that the KGB was trying to do, was trying to run those kinds of operations? It, I, we certainly assumed it, and we'd seen whiffs of it, but to see concrete, detailed, in my view, unassailable proof of it, I found stunning. All right, we're going to take a short break, and we'll be back with our guests in just a moment. We interrupt this program for this important announcement. MCI now offers five cents a minute every day. That's just five cents every evening and all weekend long. Presenting the billboard of the millennium. Let it rip. MCI, five cents every day. That's one powerful message. Call 1-800-EVERY-DAY to join. your doctor about Viagra. My mom's a big person. Fire me. My dad has this real important job with this big fancy office where he's the boss. He always eats lunch at these big fancy restaurants. And after he's done saving the world, we go home and play. I'd give him a tip. I drew a picture of you. The 1999 Camry. Even heroes need a car. These days you hear a lot about e-commerce, and usually it's about companies with names that end in .com. Actually, e-commerce is for any company that wants a better way to do business, like respond faster to the market, or work better with partners and customers. At Microsoft, we've helped thousands of companies build on their existing systems to create the kinds of e-commerce solutions that can make any business run smarter. 
From the creator of the practice in Ally McBeal comes the private eyes that'll get you. About your house. We do that sort of thing. David Kelly snoops ABC Sundays this fall. Pick up a copy of the Tennessean Saturday for our new expanded business section. An inside look at the working world's latest developments with Business Week in Review. Get the news you need in the Tennessean, your 21st century newspaper. Call 242 News to subscribe. And we're back once again with former CIA official Paul Redmond and former KGB General Oleg Kalugin. Uh, General Kalugin, th this uh, word of arms caches uh, hidden in several places around the United States, is that just something, to the best of your knowledge, that was a plan that was never put into effect? Or is it your impression that those arms caches either did exist or perhaps still do exist? Well, this was part of contingency planning by the KGB in the 70s and 60s. Uh, ever since uh, uh, KGB officer Lelin defected in the West in Great Britain in 71, most of these operations were closed down, and yet uh, some of the caches had been placed. Uh, in fact, I believe that the other organization, GIU, may still continue to do so because you're, you're, it's uh, the, uh, military it's, intelligence. Yeah, I was, I was just going to interrupt and tell our viewers you're talking here about military intelligence. You think that the GRU would, would, would still maintain caches like this to this day? I would, not, I would not be surprised, though, with the collapse of the USSR, most of these plans must have been scrapped. I, uh, that's my uh, belief. Uh, but some of the stuff may have remained in place, and if someone did not find it, it does not mean it does not exist. Uh, let me tell you also that uh, from what I have read in this book uh, by Bitrogin, I myself was involved in most of these operations in one way or another. In fact, I uh, touched upon or alluded to some of the operations in my memoirs. But one thing is memoirs, the other is uh, substantive and documented uh, material provided by Betrokin, and this is what makes it so different and so convincing. You always uh, insisted, uh, as I recall your own memoirs, on not revealing the identities uh, of any former agents who worked for you or former KGB officers who worked for you. Uh, Mitrokin has named names. Uh, what is, I'd, I'd just be interested in knowing what your personal attitude is toward him. Well, I have chosen my way of dealing with Russia's problems and with the KGB. Mitrokin chose his own one. Uh, we are simply different persons, but our chief goal obviously has been to destroy the old totalitarian system. He did it in his own way, I tried to do it in my own. Mr. Redmond, uh, about those names, to, to, to what degree has that been helpful? To what degree have these people actually been rounded up? And, and to what extent are there still, to this day, sleeper agents uh, here in the United States who, for one reason or another, have been left in place? Well, I, there's a lot of material uh, on illegals, and I, that's a bureau matter. I do not know what they've managed to exploit out of that. Uh, from the material, there were hundreds and hundreds of agent identities names, including several in this country that haven't, come, I believe, are not in that book. Stunning detail in the handling of those people, uh, which to me was one of the most interesting parts of it. And I'm hoping and the, the Bureau will continue to pursue those cases, I'm sure they are, as they will be pursuing the other services overseas, will be pursuing those uh, foreign leads that came from this material. When you talk about uh, stunning details in the handling, what kind of thing are you talking about? I know you're reluctant to talk about specific... Well, where the person was met, when the person was met, the circumstances of meeting the person, what the person provided by way of, of our secrets, uh, the meeting arrangements, the money that was paid, etc. So, in other words, this Communications is, plans. This is the kind of thing that would convince you then that the, that the material that Mitrokin provided uh, is is legitimate, but let me 
turn it around and say if indeed the KGB or its successor today was still trying uh, to, to operate a massive disinformation campaign against the United States, wouldn't they naturally leave an awful lot of accurate information in there? Well, any disinformation program has to have some truth in it. My point is that there's just so much data that's uh, corroborated from other sources and obtained in different ways that it's inconceivable to me that this could be some disinformation dump. And the purpose of it, I just could not imagine. Uh, Mr. Redmond, let's, let's end where we began. I, I began by saying that Mr. Matrokin uh, walked into a U.S. embassy and was actually turned away. Do you, do you have understanding or resentment or contempt for the officer who turned him away? He was not actually turned away. He was told to come back, in fact, but we never heard from him again. We do not know. He says he volunteered twice to two other embassies. CIA headquarters, to my knowledge, never heard about that. I do not know, and I don't think headquarters knew, who eventually turned him away, whether it was a Foreign Service type or a CIA person. But, uh, I mean, you, you, you must be looking back at that and shaking your head. And I just respect. shake my head and, and it's with complete chagrin. All right, Mr. Redmond, General Kalugan, I thank you both very much for joining us this evening. I'll be back in a moment.